see some faces. Um, I see some faces and I see some names. I'm glad to be with you all today. Uh, we are going to be talking about managing religious dynamics and first break psychosis. Um, my hope here is that we can spend about an hour kind of going through the material. And then after that, uh, I have about a 30 minute time frame where we can ask or do some question and answer and discussion based on experiences you may have encountered or questions that you may have about the material or just kind of a free for all discussion. Um, I do have the chat block open. So if you do want to type questions as we go, I'll try to answer those in real time. Uh, if I can't answer them in real time, we'll attach them to the end. So if that works for everybody, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And as other people come in, I'm sure they can catch up with us. So um, like Joni said, I am the chaplain for Eastern State Hospital. I've been here for um, about almost 11 years now. I've been working with psychiatric patients in an inpatient setting. Uh, it's kind of interesting. My first job outside of graduate school was at a homeless shelter in inner city, New Orleans. I worked for a place called the Brantley Center. And what I didn't realize at the time um, was about, I think statistically at that time, about 68% of all the homeless people that I was working with had some degree of mental illness they were living with. Um, New Orleans was a little bit different because they didn't have the the kind of the social support of a major hospital like Eastern State, like our region. So we kind of have like a social triangle here where, where people go between like uh, jail, the homeless shelter system and the hospital system. Uh, there, a lot of people depended on the homeless shelter system because the hospital system wasn't there. Um, and at the time, I didn't have a whole lot of clinical training. And I was dealing a lot with uh, mental illness. I was straight out of seminary, straight out of graduate school. And uh, out of 91 semester hours of graduate level training, I had one pastoral counseling class and we didn't talk about SPMI at all. Uh, and, and so I realized I was dealing with people who had, you know, behavior that I wasn't familiar with, that I didn't understand. Um, and, and it's taken me a long time over the years to be able to understand and spot what some of that behavior actually is and be able to sort through it. And so hopefully I can give you some of that knowledge as we go through today. And hopefully my slide advances. There we go. So kind of what we're going to cover today, first of all, I want you to have at the end of our time a basic understanding of what spiritual development actually looks like, not only in, in people that have SPMI, but also uh, people who are you know, spiritually, for lack of a better term, healthy, uh, and also look at the distinctions between healthy faith and religious pathology, because I think that's really hard for a lot of clinicians is to say, okay, when I'm looking at a person's um, faith activity is, is what I'm seeing healthy or is it destructive in nature? And so I'm going to try to give you some guidelines in terms of how to assess that. Uh, I also want you to have some knowledge related to the types of religious delusions you might see, types of delusions in general you're going to see. Uh, where does the substance of religious delusion come from? And then treatment considerations when you're addressing religious delusions. I also want you to have some type of basic knowledge uh, related to interventions, practical strategies, um, as opposed, you know, as, as it, as it um, applies to engaging people who have symptoms of religious delusion. Um, now, all that being said, it's taken me a long time to kind of cultivate the work that I've done and kind of come to some degree of understanding. I will tell you some of the stuff that I'm presenting. I'm trying to present evidence-based as much as possible, but there's also a fair amount of anecdotal information that I'm presenting as well that there's just not simply an evidence base for. So I'll try to tease that out as we go. I do want to begin our discussion um, with with a certain, I think, respect that the topic needs. Um, I think when you when you're looking at at religion and spirituality, particularly when you're looking at it from a clinical perspective, I think you have to be very careful not to just turn it into a clinical thing, uh, because spirituality and religion is very a very personal thing to people. And even though we're looking at it from a clinical perspective, I, I don't want to relegate it to just a psychological process. Yeah, you know, I wanted to. I want us to look at it as something that, that can be beneficial, but in the context of SPMI, sometimes it can also be destructive, but but it's it's a big part of, of who a person is. Um, and, and I think to relegate it too much to just the clinical aspect kind of takes away some of the power of it. So, so I just want to give the, the topic the, the adequate respect I think that it deserves. So spirituality versus religion. Uh, the jumping off point here is is... A lot of people don't realize or they don't make the association that religion and spirituality are two different things, um, particularly like in the context of working with somebody in, in a clinical environment. You know, for me as a, a psychiatric chaplain and a pastoral counselor, when I sit down with somebody, 
I don't really care what they believe. You know, my, my job in the hospital context is different from like a church pastor that would maybe stand up in the pulpit and preach or offer spiritual resources. You know, my role is to say, okay, what does this person already have? And, and, and are they using it in a healthy way, number one? And if they're not using it in a healthy way, how can I assist them in using what they have in a healthy way to move towards healing and wholeness? And, and for me, the, the discussion leans a lot more towards the spiritual than the religious. And, and I'm going to tease out the two here now. Uh, through the course of my career and, and reading, this is the best definition of, of spirituality that I've actually encountered. It's, it's from the Indian Journal of Psychiatric Medicine from 2008, and this guy named Verghese wrote it. He says, spirituality is a globally acknowledged concept. It involves belief and obedience to an all-powerful force, usually God. You know, I, would, I would also say, you know, so substitute that with higher power, you know, who controls the universe and the destiny of man or woman, as the case may be. It involves the ways in which people fulfill what they hold to be the purpose of their lives, a search for meaning in life, a sense of connectedness to the universe. Uh, the universality of spirituality extends across creed and culture. At the same time, spirituality is very much personal and unique to each person. It's a sacred realm of the human experience. It produces in, in humankind qualities such as love, honesty, patience, tolerance, compassion, uh, a sense of detachment sometimes, faith and hope. So I feel like that's a pretty comprehensive de uh, definition of spirituality. Um, to condense that down a little bit, I, I think spirituality is about a meaning-making process. You know, who are we in light of something larger than ourselves? You know, if you're a, a theist or a Christian person, um, you're looking at yourself as who am I as a created being in light of the creator? But when you're looking at the existential questions, you know, what is the meaning and purpose of my life? Why am I here? Uh, uh, I'm searching for meaning and purpose in my life. Those are those are all spiritual pursuits. And so when you're when you're looking at spirituality, you're looking kind of at some degree, it's kind of an amorphous concept. Like you're backing out. It's a big thing. It's how a person seeks meaning and purpose. Uh, in, in contrast, religion is kind of the the lens that people see their sense of spirituality through. So, like for instance, uh, I'm I'm an ordained Baptist minister, so I'm I'm Christian in my orientation. Now I I, I see value in different faith. Uh, practices like I engage in Buddhist meditation and I uh, find some value in Taoism and some other some other religious practices um, and those are the lenses that I see my sense of spirituality through so I'm, I'm trained at a Christian seminary so that that's kind of the lens that I'm seeing my meaning making process through so for a Christian that lens would be Christianity for a Buddhist person that lens would be Buddhism um, and, and so on and so forth depending on what faith tradition that person is from now, that being said, I, I would dare say that even the person who is a non-theist or, or an atheist or even an agnostic uh, has some degree of, of spirituality about themselves. Because going back to the idea of spirituality, it's not necessarily hinged to the idea of believing in a God or a higher power. It, it's, it's hinged to the idea of a meaning-making process. And, and I think that every human being, whether you believe in, in a God or if you're atheist or agnostic, all of the but we're all seeking some degree of meaning and purpose in our life. And I think spirituality is is, you know, how we see our meaning making process. And then again, as I said, religion is how we focus that process. I think patience, uh, I've seen people that, that identify as spiritual, but not religious. I've seen people that I would characterize as religious and not spiritual. Um, if you look at the the qualities of a healthy faith, a healthy connection between spirituality and religion, there's an element of congruence in there. Like when that person is talking about their belief systems and you're watching their actions and practice, there there's an element of where they're lining up. I mean, I think you can see, um, you know, not at all to get, I'm not trying to go into the political realm, but if you look at, at public spheres and like ministers in the public sphere, religious people in the public sphere, Sometimes you can see in those people, there's a difference between what they're saying and what they're doing. And that to me is indicative of an unhealthy faith or spiritual engagement. Now, the people that you see where their life matches up with what they're saying and what they're doing matches what they're saying, there's a, there's a congruence there that suggests to me that they have a healthy spiritual engagement. So jumping off, uh, looking at spiritual and religious pathology, one of the big hallmarks of, of a spiritual or religious pathology is incongruence. And you see that a lot with the SPMI population. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with that, SPMI is significant persistent mental illness. 
Bargament and Lomax uh, kind of line out some of the benefits of healthy religious practice. And I, I think when you look at religion from a clinical perspective, there's been years like from, from Freud and Albert Ellis and onward where religion and, and psychology, psychiatry have kind of been at odds with one another. You know, Freud, he, I think he called it the opiate of the masses. Albert Ellis, he didn't have a very good um, uh, thought on religious practice. Uh, but the reality is, if you look at actually the evidence-based research, um, religious participation helps people with self-regulation, attachment, connectedness, emotional comfort, meaning, and again, again, just engaging spiritual resources in their meaning-making process. So it, it has a healthy place when it's done in a manner or engaged in, in a manner that's not pathological or destructive. Benefits of religious involvement. This is a quote by Harold Koenig. It pretty well states the same thing. The person has lower rates of depression, faster recovery, uh, lower rates of suicide. Uh, that, that's one of the big benefits of religious practice. And, and again, I think that varies from religion to religion, but religious practice is, is a huge protective factor against suicide. Uh, and, and I think suicide is a huge factor in those living with SPMI. And so, so I think it can be a very, very helpful protective factor. Uh, it's a helpful factor when you look at substance abuse, uh, lower rates of alcohol and drug use, because like if you look at NA and AA, those are all higher power based programs. You know, there's an element of spirituality in those. Um, it, it, it tends to give people some degree of a moral compass. And so you see less delinquency and criminal activity, uh, even in, you know, marital stability, marital satisfaction, relational satisfaction, you know, your relationship with your significant other people that engage in some type of spiritual practice tend to have some, uh, you know, more stability in their relationships than those that don't. So let's talk a little bit about what a healthy sense of spirituality looks like, because here in a little bit, we're going to be talking about what, what um, religious pathology looks like. And, and I think um, the first question, again, to sort through is spirituality versus religion. What's the difference? And the second question to look at before we get into what, what religious or spiritual pathology looks like is what does it look like to develop healthy from a spiritual standpoint? Um, and to kind of go through that, I'm going to engage a guy named James Fowler. Um, James Fowler came up with this book, and I think he wrote it in 1981. And, and he came up with these six stages of faith. And he, he initially attached it to uh, Eric Erickson's model on human development. And I'm sure there are people in this audience that are cringing when you hear me say Eric Erickson. <laughs> I do uh, talks for nursing students pretty often. And whenever I ask them who Eric Erickson is, they all kind of cringe and want to crawl under the table. Um, but Erickson, I found, you know, for me, that's the that's the human development model that I use. And, and Fowler saw the value in it, too. And so he attached his stages of faith uh, to Erickson's model. These are the stages of faith. Yeah, I was right. Uh, 1981 was when Fowler wrote his book. And, and it's, you know, appropriately entitled Stages of Faith. Um, when you go through the stages of faith, the first stage is, and I'm not going to use his verbiage because it's kind of fancy. I'm going to kind of translate it into what it really means. Stage one, if you're looking at it like from a Christian perspective, is that person is wandering around. They're trying to find something that they believe in. They know there's something larger than themselves, but they don't know what it is. Uh, stage two is kind of like this. Um, it's where I would say where you see people have conversion experiences. Uh, the challenge with stage two, and, and Fowler kind of relegates stage two to more like a child life, childlike belief system. It's very concrete and very literal in nature. There's not a lot of room for metaphor. Uh, there's not a lot of room for um, abstract thought, and it's very just concrete and literal. And then stage three, um, he calls it synthetic conventional. I call this, you know, I cook for the potluck and I teach Sunday school. You know, this is a person that's actively engaged in a church community or faith community or some group. Uh, they're participating, they're learning about their faith and the dimension of that faith, and they're growing to some degree. Now, when you get to four, five, and six is where things start to get a little bit real. And, and one of the challenges here is when you get into stage four, usually most people don't engage in stage four of their own volition. Usually stage four happens when somebody goes through some type of tragic event. Um, and when they have that tragic event happen in their life, whether it's a divorce, uh, the loss of a job, the loss of a parent or a loved one, uh, God forbid, the loss of a child, something tragic happens in their life. But it's something tragic that happens to the degree that their sense of faith and spirituality is not developed enough to handle. 
And so when a person hits stage four, uh, there, there's another guy named Robert Gulick, who's a pastoral theologian. He calls that stage the wall. And he basically says, you can't go over it, around it, or, or under it. You have to go through it. And so it becomes an integrative process. And what, what makes that stage four important is that, that uh, in that space, you start to see this dialectical kind of dynamic happening. Because before in stage three, you have a person like, like say, for instance, they they believe in the Bible. They read the Bible. They said, the Bible says this about my life. So this is the way it is, period, end, full stop. In stage four, there's an element of questioning that starts to happen because, the, again, the person's faith is not adequately developed to be able to, to address the tragedy they've experienced. And so they start asking difficult questions of their faith. And so instead of having this one-way dialogue, a two-way dialogue engages. And so it's almost like a, a, um, a cognitive behavioral therapy process where you're thinking about how you're feeling and you're feeling about how you think. And so it becomes an integrative process. And that's what Gulick means when he says you have to go through the wall. You have to integrate the material. And in the process of integrating the material, your faith grows. And when you come out on the other side of stage five, you have a very personalized faith. Uh, your faith may not look like everybody else you go to church with. It's personalized. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of who you are. Um, and, and, and you own it. It's yours. It's not something somebody else has just packaged and handed it to you. You've unpacked it. You've looked at it. It's well integrated. And then stage six, Fowler calls universalizing faith. And, and that stage, um, I, I think it's largely... Um, misunderstood i don't think fowler did it justice because i don't think he understood it either and and basically what fowler says is stage six is like jesus and gandhi and and really well-developed people spiritually developed people and and those those folks are so foreign to the average person that they're just not understandable and, and oftentimes they end up getting killed you know, jesus and gandhi are two good examples of that now the challenge here when you're looking at Fowler's stages of faith, this is how you know traditional faith development goes. Now, to be honest with you, in faith development, the average person in, in a church congregation is going to be around stage three. Um, and Fowler even says that there's a lot of church pastors that don't navigate past stage three because they're not comfortable sitting with the discomfort of the questions necessary to do the integrative work. Now, as it applies to people with SPMI, unfortunately, the majority of them sit around stage two. Uh, and stage two, again, is, is con, you know, characterized by concrete and literal so thought. Um, if you'll notice when you're talking to people that, that have a psychiatric illness, oftentimes, like, they won't understand uh, abstract concepts. They won't understand sarcasm. They're very concrete and literal. So, like, for instance, if, if the Bible says something specific, uh, they're going to do it. And unfortunately, this sometimes translates into some really negative things. Um, through the course of my career, a couple of times, like there's a scriptural passage that says, you know, if your right hand offended thee, cut it off. And and I've unfortunately met a couple of people that, you know, they, they had sexual hangups and they ended up self-castrating based on that, um, that passage that they took very literally. And so when when you have somebody with SPMI, they're likely in stage two. They're likely very concrete, very literal. If you look at the substance of their delusions and, and psychotic features and religious delusion, um, they tend to be concrete and literal in nature. They're not up for discussion. They're not up for argument. They're, this is how it is to that person. The other thing that, that people are susceptible to in the mythic literal stage is magical thinking. And what that looks like is that... Uh, if I pray this certain prayer this certain way, then God is going to answer it, period. Uh, like I've got a lady that I work with every time I show up on the unit, she asks me to pray for her, and, and I do, and, and she's appropriate in it. Uh, but she's always oddly specific in her prayer. Like she wants a specific type of apartment with specific things in that apartment with specific neighbors. And, and in her mind, if we just keep praying for it, it's going to happen just that way. So, so magical thinking almost treats, treats the, uh, the idea of a higher power of God like Santa Claus. So taking a step beyond the spiritual development that Fowler presents, there's another lady named Anna Maria Rizzuto. Um, I think she's passed away now, but uh, she did some work in the 70s and 80s. She was a psychiatrist and she was looking at faith development. And her area of interest was uh, 
um, God concept and God image. This quote is from her book. Uh, it says, the God of symbols and signs I call the concept of God, the expression of image of God, I used to refer to the God of the inner experience of the believer. So she separates um, how a person understands their higher power into a cognitive section and an emotive section. And, and I think she's right in that. Um, when you look at God image, as she calls it, uh, this is how a person emotionally understands their concept of a higher power. A lot of times when you look at children, it, it's almost, if you heard of the term ar archetype, it's almost like a thought form that things attach to. And so, so to develop with a God image is kind of like a projective process. So you have a child that, um, you know, their first major attachment to their caregivers, their parents. And so automatically they're assuming the qualities of their parents or, or projecting them onto this archetypal higher power figure, i.e. God. Um, now, this works great if you have loving and caring parents. It's a particular challenge if you have, you know, alcoholic or abusive parents or parents that were emotionally neglectful uh, because then your, your image of God becomes somewhat tarnished. Um, but that's the, the, the emotional concept of how a person understands God. Your God image influences, it's interesting, there's, there's one study I, I put on here, it uses Bowlby's attachment theory, and it was talking about gender differences and how people reference God. Now, I will preface that this study was done on neurotypical college students, and so it was not the SP my population. But what they noticed in men is that the idea of a loving God or loving characteristics of a higher power uh, were predicted primarily by attachment to one's mother versus controlling characteristics were referenced to both parents. And a distant God was, was related to the combination of viewing self as distant. So there's an element of self uh, reference as well. Um, if, if you look at, at women, they tend to be more self-referencing in, in their concepts of God. Uh, now, that being said, that, that this is based on this study, my experience of a lot of people who have SPMI, particularly those with schizophrenia um, who deal with religious delusion, those individuals have a very high uh, self-referencing element to their delusions and their interactions. And it was very interesting, and this is something that, that I've never seen written down, but it's something that I've experienced anecdotally. A lot, a lot of times as a, as a pastoral caregiver or counselor, one of the ways that, that I shift the visit or shift the conversation or move towards ending the visit is I'll offer to pray for the person. 99.9% .9 of the time, if you hand me somebody who has schizophrenia with religious delusion, they will either decline the prayer or they will, they will divert the conversation to avoid the prayer. Uh, and, and it's interesting. I think that has something to do with them being self-referenced in nature in terms of how they're seeing the higher power in God. Um, it, I, I don't have a, a great answer for that, but it's just something that I see anecdotally go on. So God concept formation, on the other hand, is, um, you know, how a person intellectually understands God. This is the stuff you learn from reading, from Sunday school, from what you've been taught by your parents um, in terms of your intellectual functioning. And if you look at, you know, spiritual formation in general, the goal is to have congruence. You know, it should be your God image and your God concept should line up. Um, a good example of where you'll see incongruence be problematic is, for instance, somebody who's in an AA or an NA program. All of the A programs use the idea of a higher power and the idea that, that you're powerless against your addiction, et cetera, and that you're leaning on this idea of a higher power to help you. Well, if you have dissonance in your higher power image, if your God image and your God concept are misaligned, and on one hand, you've been taught in Sunday school that God is loving and caring and kind and all this good stuff. And on the other hand, you're projecting um, these characteristics of an alcoholic, abusive father who beat on you all the time. Well, that's very misaligned from this, this loving image of God. And so you have this distortion between the two. And I would call that, uh, you know, in, in, in behavioral science, they call it cognitive dissonance when how a person thinks now they feel don't line up. Uh, I would call that spiritual distress in, in working with people with, with religious dynamics and issues. And so a lot of times uh, the, the meaning making is challenged because the God image and God concept isn't lined up. And, and I do see this concept with individuals with SPMI as well.
other common sources of spiritual distress in people. And, and a lot of times you'll see these in the context of not just religious delusion, but also religious preoccupation is like this overscrupulosity. Like it's okay to feel guilt. I think guilt has a purpose in life because it causes us to reestablish relationships and apologize and things like that. Uh, but there are some people that become overly apologetic, overly scrupulous to the point where it, it moves from guilt into shame and then that becomes very destructive. Uh, frustrations related to recovery. Um, sometimes that can attach to the magical thinking dynamic that, that's part of the mythic literal stage I talked about a moment ago. You know, people want to say a prayer and things be fixed. Uh, an interesting example of that is I've, I've got a patient who's on our medically fragile unit. He's, he's a young man. Um, he had a drug overdose. He, he was he was a pretty religious person prior to, but he also had a substance abuse problem. And he had a, a drug overdose and had a major stroke from it. And so he's got some significant neurocognitive decline. Uh, he's got a lot of physical decline. He can't walk and that sort of thing. But he kept asking me to anoint him. He wanted me to anoint him with oil. And I was hesitant to do that because at one point we had another patient that was somewhat religiously preoccupied and she prayed for the guy and she prayed for his healing and he was believing that he was healed because of his magical thinking and he tried to stand up out of his chair and he hit the ground um which was you know unfortunate so i was hesitant to um to actually anoint this guy because i didn't want him getting out of his chair from the magical thinking perspective i think he was fixed and, and you do see that a lot uh, people want rituals and that sort of thing i'm very careful what i do ritual wise with patients because i don't want them to think all right if i do this this is going to fix me um sense of personal worthlessness yeah you know, i think that's where spmi people and neurotypical people struggle with with similar dynamics of spiritual distress you know in that in that one i think you fall into sh you see shame as well and and I often tell people there's no space for shame in in any type of recovery process it's it's shame is is horribly destructive there's no redeeming quality to it there is of guilt but just not of shame and then existential questions and crisis uh relationship difficulties relationship difficulties is hard for neurotypical people but it's it's particularly rough i think for people that live with spmi because uh, their behaviors are supposed to push people away uh, we do visitation here at the hospital and i would say that probably less than 10 percent of our people get some type of visitor coming to see them for visitation so um, that that is a source of anxiety and distress for people so why does all this matter again just like us as, you know as neurotypical people we're trying to answer the the existential questions of life well a psychiatric patient people living with spmi are doing the same thing uh, some challenges that people living with SPI, SPMI faced, uh, church stereotypes. If you look at people that have SPMI, even if they are uh, appropriate in terms of their religious participation and that sort of thing, they always have lower instances of like congregational involvement. And a lot of it is because congregations don't understand them. They've had bad experience with the con with congregations. You know, as I said in the beginning, you know, the majority of, of pastors, like my seminary training prior to my clinical training, I had one pastoral counseling class. And so people are not being taught um, in, in the process of their development as ministers what SPMI looks like and how to navigate it. And so, and so in the absence of that knowledge, uh, the people that come to their congregations with SPMI tend to be marginalized. Uh, there's the self-esteem, personal worth. Again, that ties back into shame and the shame dynamics. Um, for some people, there's an inability to see value in religion and spirituality. And, and anecdotally, um, I see that attached to shame a lot. Sometimes people's, uh, like one end of the spectrum will be over scrupulosity. The other end of the spectrum will be uh, just throwing religion out altogether. It doesn't have any value. And, and sometimes that's an attempt to avoid the, the shame that, that, that people incur engaging in religious activity. Uh, and then past participation in toxic or pathological religious environments. So this chart is pretty pretty important. Um, one of my colleagues and I, uh, he and I work together to do uh, spirituality groups and do a lot of programming together. And, and we work together for a while trying to figure out how do you really tease out what's the difference between healthy faith and religious pathology? Because it is so close to a person. And this is the best that we've got so far, uh, empowering versus disempowering, connecting versus disconnecting. I mean, th those are pretty obvious. At the end of the day, when, when you're looking at, is it a healthy faith or a sense of religious pathology? 
I look at, at two words. I look at um, connection and empowerment. You know, is it connecting to the person? Are they connecting to themselves? Are they connecting to the people around them? Are they connecting to God as they understand God? And are they getting a sense of empowerment from that and ultimately may be able to empower others as well? And I think if it's connecting and empowering, it's generally is a healthy spiritual practice. If it's a disconnecting and disempowering, it's generally not a healthy spiritual practice. Uh, the other piece that I look for in both religious delusion and religious peer preoccupation when I'm teasing out if something's pathological or not is when the person engages in the activity, uh, is it giving them more than it's taking or is it taking away more than it's giving them? Because if it's taking away more than it's giving them, it's destructive because a healthy sense of spiritual practice gives a person more than the emotional expenditure of participating in the practice. Like, like for instance, when a, when a person prays, um, or they're participating in a worship session. Yes, there's an emotional expenditure in that process, but the emotional return is very high as well. And so on a healthy spiritual practice, generally the emotional return is higher than the emotional output to participate. So again, the role of spiritual care, as I said at the beginning, you know, I don't care what a person believes when I talk to them. I'm interested in, uh, I mean, what, what, you know, religion they are, any of that is what I mean. Um, I'm interested to say, okay, does this person have something that they can use and how can I help them use it in a healthy way to move towards healing and wholeness? Uh, going back to the connection empowerment, how do we help individuals living with SPMI to experience connection empowerment? Well, basic management of first episode psychosis. These are just some, you know, jumping off points and moving parts. Uh, Everything that I read, I mean, every article that I came across said early intervention is key. When you're looking at um, the development of psychiatric illness, most people are developing illness 14, 16 years old into their mid-20s time frame. And a lot of times it develops subtly, sometimes it develops quickly, but these people are spending one to two years before they're receiving treatment. And the longer a person spends in that psychotic space, the more destructive it is for them, not only to, to their relationships, but all, also to their overall health. Uh, we want to engage people in, in holistic uh, types of activities, you know, that include physical activity. One of the ones that I put down here that I think is huge is supportive employment. Uh, I think um, when I encounter our patients here in the hospital, one of the things that, that's, that's missing for them is a sense of purpose. Uh, and I think employ, employment can ground people with that sense of purpose. I, I have some patients that come through, they're ready to get out of the hospital and get back at it so they can go back to work. And other people just struggle with, you know, what do they do with their time? Um, and so I think employment can help with that sense of purpose for a lot of people. Uh, forming an alliance with the person, avoiding conflict, especially avoiding conflict prematurely. I think flexibility is key. I, I think um, we as clinicians often go in with a, a preset goal. Like I, I'll do that. Like when I go visit somebody, I'll get a referral from the physician or the social work team. Could you go see this person for this reason? And I'll go in there with that set purpose in mind. But I also sometimes have to go in three circles to actually get to the point that they, they want me to address with them. And so I think flexibility is important. I think a lack of flexibility can, can sometimes be disruptive to the process. Making stuff youth attractive, uh, because a lot of times, again, we're looking at, at people between the ages of, you know, 14 into their mid-20s, younger people are having first break psychosis, and so we need to make our interventions youth attractive. Uh, we need to focus on the the entire family and the basic needs of the person. You know, if you look at the Maslow pyramid, if we don't have housing and the basic things taken care of, how are we supposed to manage the larger things? Uh, focusing on the entire family, recognizing that the individual is not an island unto themselves. They're part of an entire family and recognizing the emotional strain of, uh, of that this person's illness may be putting on the family. They need support, that they need guidance as well. And considering social work, again, work goals, we're cultivating self-worth, self-esteem in the individual. And, and I really think purpose is really important, whether that be work or some type of hobby or some type of volunteering. Some way for people to feel like they're plugging in in a meaningful way is, is really important for, um, I think, a person's well-being. So after all that, what is psychosis? Well, 
It's a loose description of an amalgamation of psychological symptoms resulting from a loss of contact reality. Basically, that person is not seeing reality as you and I are. In their lifetime, roughly one and a half to three and a half percent of people will meet the diagnostic criteria for psychosis. Um, first time psychosis, about 50 and 100,000 people will experience it. And incidences of schizophrenia is 15 in 100,000 people. And frankly, that when I looked at those numbers, those numbers uh, kind of surprised me. They were lower than I thought. But it does go to show, you know, how relatively not common schizophrenia and psychotic features are. Psychosis can be used to describe delusions, hallucinations, disorganized thought, uh, disorganized behavior, and negative symptoms. So a fancy $12 word, like if you want to go later on and dazzle and amaze with your knowledge at the bar, is uh, anisognosia. And anisognosia literally means without disease knowledge. And it, it translates into poor insight. Uh, when, when you're talking to somebody, roughly 57 to 98% of people with schizophrenia lack insight. Now, clearly, this translates into to poor treatment outcomes because that person may come to the hospital. We may get them stabilized on a medication that's working for them, but because they don't have awareness that they have an illness, they stop taking their medication, they decompensate, and they end up back in the hospital. Then, problematically, each time that person decompensates and they get worse, they're doing more damage to their brain, their baseline shifts. Um, a great example of that is I have a guy on one of the units right now, and uh, I've been taking care of him for 10 years. And, and unfortunately, like when he first had his first break when he was younger, he was an incredible athlete. He was being scouted by the Atlanta Braves to play baseball. I mean, he had this, this promising future in front of him. And then he had his first break. And when I first met him 10 years ago, he could have a conversation and he was pretty salient. And I mean, you'd see him responding. You'd see the, the features of his schizophrenia. Uh, but he was—he he could have clear and directed conversations when he was on his medication. Now, his, his length of hospitalizations, because he's been in and out of the hospital so many times, and he's had you know so many episodes of decompensation, his baseline has gotten way worse. Uh, when I ask him direct questions, you know, he often comes up with nonsensical answers that are not based in reality. And, and I think he would be in a much different place had his medication and has it had his illness been been managed consistently for those 10 years. So every time there's a relapse, the person gets worse, their baseline shifts, uh, and a lack of insight drastically uh, impacts that. Religious delusions, the DSM-5 defines those as uh, fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. And they, they often don't make sense. Going back to what I was talking about at the beginning, one of the, the hallmarks of um, a, a spiritual distress and a break in, in spirituality versus religion is uh, a sense of incongruence. And, and in, in religious delusion, you often see a sense of incongruence. Um, religious delusions can look a lot of different ways. Um, the prevalence is, is fairly high. Um, in one study out of 193 participants, you had 24% of them had religious delusions. A study in Switzerland said 21% of their group had delusions. Lithuania said 64% had religious delusions. Uh, there is a direct correlation in, when you look at countries um, regarding their religiosity and their instances of religious delusion and preoccupation. Uh, for instance, like I said here, you know, countries with higher levels of atheism have lower levels of religious delusion versus countries that have higher religiosity tends to have higher levels of uh, religious delusion and preoccupation. Uh, I actually had a conversation a few years ago. We had a doctor who's a Russian locum tenum doctor who'd actually practiced in Russia as a psychiatrist. And he and I were talking one day and I asked him, I said, do they have the same instance of, of religious preoccupation and delusion in Russia that they have here? And he said, oh, no. <laughs> Um, he, he did say they still had the uh, delusions that the government's out to get me and all that stuff over there. But then I kind of looked at him and I said, well, you know, that might not be a delusion over there. I'm not sure. Um, but you can see, you know, based on the religiosity of the country, higher or lower levels of, of religious delusion and preoccupation based on the country. Um Religious delusions are often associated with poor outcomes, a lot of times because there's so much conviction to, to religious delusions. 
when you see religious delusions, whether they're grandiose or persecutory in nature, which we're going to talk a little more, a little bit more about characterizations of delusions here in a minute, there almost is always a, this fear-based component to it, uh, or or a magical thinking component to it when you're looking at grandiose delusions. Um, and, and I think that goes back to the mythic literal phase and Fowler stage where people are mostly at that stage to that magical thinking, concrete, literal thought process. Um, and I also think it has to do, particularly in America, with what, 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 what we have access to. Like, if you think of the things that we have access to, like if you have a mental illness and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're watching cable access television, the religious material that you have access to is often very fear-based in nature. Um, you know, the hellfire and brimstone type prophecy stuff, which people get pulled into because it's fear-based. Or you got Peter Popoff and his miracle spring water, which caters to the magical thinking. And so a lot of the uh, the religious material that's available, like on public access television, is very destructive to people that have SPMI. It feeds right into the delusions and, and the destructive thought processes. And again, a lack of awareness leads to poorer outcomes. Um, when you look at religious delusions, a higher recorded positive and negative symptoms on scale, lower global assessment functioning. People who have religious delusions and religious preoccupation will often wait longer to uh, seek treatment or re-engage treatment. Sometimes because, you know, God told me not to take medicine, the delusion becomes a part of not wanting to participate in treatment, or they just simply don't see a problem. They see their um, their symptomology as, as components of their, their faith process, which, which is a pretty problematic thing in psychiatric care. I see it less with people with schizophrenia, where I, where I really see a lot of people confuse their spirituality and their emotional health are people that have bipolar disorder. Uh, particularly when they get into mania and hypomania, um, they often experience this sense of euphoria. And a lot of people, especially if they have a religious background, when they feel that sense of euphoria, they'll experience that as some type of deep connection with God or the holy or the divine or whatnot. Um, and this is problematic for that person when they get put on mood stabilizers and their baseline goes back to that like of a neurotypical person. Because I've had dozens of conversations with people uh, who had bipolar one and, and had manic features, and then they got put on mood stabilizers, they leveled out, and they were tremendously sad because suddenly they didn't feel like they were connected to God anymore because they didn't experience that euphoria. Um, and so in that way, they're confusing their sense of spirituality with their the manifestations of their illness. Uh, people with religious delusion tend to experience uh, the need for more medication or prescribe more medication. And again, the conviction of the religious delusions tends to be higher of other delusions, making it more challenging to treat. So where do the delusions come from? I alluded to earlier, you know, what do we have access to religiously in terms of programming on television? I think that impacts it. Um, a person can't have a delusion of something if they weren't exposed to it. And so a delusion comes from exposure and then this disorganized regurgitation of what the person is exposed to religiously and otherwise. So exposure, uh, cultural factors, you know, if you look at the socio-political factors, particularly like the divisiveness in America, um, in the last few years, the, the shift in socio-political factors in America and the divisiveness, I've seen a drastic change in religious delusions. Um, and I've seen the incorporation of political dynamics and religious delusions because people are intaking things through the news and it's becoming part of their delusion. Uh, symptom burden and then mentalizing. And what I mean by mentalizing is uh, you'll have a person... Uh, now, by nature, human beings associate things, but people who have, like, say, schizophrenia or, or other psychotic disorders will often take little things and connect it and find some huge meaning in little things. Um, that's, that's what I mean by mentalizing. They'll connect little bitty things to their delusional process as a almost a form of cognitive bias for a person living with mental illness. Basic types of delusions. Uh, persecutory is pretty obvious. Somebody's out to get me. Uh, referential uh, example of that, I've got a lady who was in one of my groups the other day, and uh, we were doing introductions. We usually do a, lot, a little icebreaker and, and ask people to give like their favorite ice cream or something in their name. And then the icebreaker, when the lady gave me her name, she said her last name was Zuckerberg. <laughs> well, her referential delusion was that she's married to Mark Zuckerberg, the guy who founded Facebook. 
and then that's kind of a firm fixed belief she has what's interesting is that is that delusion is kind of off to itself when we go into spirituality groups or she participates in chapel she has a very healthy level of religious functioning and so so sometimes delusions can be kind of compartmentalized or somebody can have like that referential delusion that doesn't impact her spiritual practices or somebody can have a a, a religious or spiritual delusion but then it doesn't impact other areas of their life it just it just stays there um now that doesn't mean that's everybody, but it's possible. Uh, somatic delusions. We often have people that, um, you know, believe that they're pregnant or you know carrying God's child or whatnot. Uh, and then religious and grandiose delusions. Obviously, those are pretty obvious what they are. And and I see sometimes also mixed feature delusions, uh, particularly with religious delusions. I'll see a mixture of grandiosity and persecutory delusions a lot. Uh, we had a lady who came through here a while back who told me that she was God's wife and she didn't need a chaplain for obvious reasons. Um, but it was it was strange that going back to the idea of incongruence, she had this grandiosity that she was God's wife, but from a persecutory standpoint, she thought all the nurses were out to get her. Well, if you're looking at it from a logical standpoint, you know, in a, in a congruent standpoint, you'd say, well, if you're God's wife, you shouldn't have anything to worry about, right? You know, the nurses are okay they're not going to bother you if god's your husband uh but she couldn't make that connection either so so there's a there's an incongruence there and, and a mixture of features in her delusion i knew we were making some uh headway with her one day when i walked on the unit though and she actually asked me to pray for her for something you know and i think that that raises a good point because when somebody starts on their medication um, and, and I think you can see this outpatient with, with first break psychosis, or you can see it inpatient when a person's going back to their baseline. Um, you'll see the medication start to work. You know, in that case, she was asking me to pray for, and so the medication seems like it started to work. She, she's coming out of the psychosis. Yesterday, I had a conversation with a gentleman. He's living with schizophrenia. And uh, a couple of days ago, he barricaded himself in his room because he had this this delusion that he'd missed the rapture. And so they they gave me a referral to go talk to him. But what was interesting in the course of the conversation, I asked him, I said, I heard that you had an issue over the weekend of, of kind of barricading yourself in your room. What was that about? Well, he didn't give me a religious answer. You know, he gave me kind of a, a vague sidebar answer. What that suggests to me is that he's kind of holding back because he's concerned about what I'm going to think about what he was what he was going to say in terms of his delusion. But that tells me that his medication is starting to work because otherwise he would have just thrown out the delusion and not cared what I said. And so, so sometimes when medication is starting to work, you kind of see people in that limbo space where elements of the delusion are still there, but you can start to see them slowly be able to have some awareness or come out of it. Now, one big thing to be concerned about are delusions that, that are higher, that have a higher degree of being associated with harm of self or others. Uh, grandiose antichrist delusions, guilt delusions, persecutory delusions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you, know, you had the gentleman who really took that scriptural passage. If your right hand offended, he cut it off and then self-castrated. You have to worry about the, the literal and concrete translations of things in that regard. Uh, but these delusions in particular are more prone to uh, self-harm and, and potentially harm of others. Uh, illnesses commonly associated with religious delusion. It, I would say you see it the most in schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, sometimes in major depressive disorder, and then sometimes it's elements in substance abuse, psychosis as well. I mean, obviously it can, it, it can surface in other areas, but these are the ones I see it the most in. Uh, and it looks a little bit different. Um, as I was saying a little while ago, with schizophrenia, um, a person tends to be a little more self-referencing in their delusions. When you look at bipolar disorder, it's it usually when I'm seeing some type of, of delusion, a lot of times it can be related to sleep deprivation because that person hasn't slept in a week because um, they're manic. And the other piece, it can be attached to the euphoria and mania, like I was talking about a moment ago. And so versus like like the schizophren the person with schizophrenia who's experiencing religious delusion, they're going to be more self-referencing. It's going to be more internal for them. The person with bipolar disorder, their their um, delusions tend to be more externally focused, or like like as though God is outside of them. Hopefully, that makes sense. So, when you're assessing and where you when you're working with people in the community, some things to consider: be careful um, jumping off from from the the 
the place of assuming pathological religious participation. So we don't want to assume that that person's religious beliefs are pathological right out of the gate. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, we're not familiar with different denominations or what other people believe. So what somebody may be saying might actually be congruent with their religious belief practices. Uh, don't focus solely on the content of the delusion. As a matter of fact, I would say don't focus on the content of the delusion at all. I would focus on the emotive content of the delusion. Uh, because the literal content of the delusion obviously is fictitious. It's disorganized. It's put together. The emotional content of the delusion is true. That's what that person's actually experiencing based on the disorganization of their thought process. So uh, example of that, uh, years ago, I worked in New Orleans, again, at a homeless shelter, and I ran into this guy one time. And he came at me very, very aggressively. And I was I was leaning on a trash can in downtown New Orleans talking to somebody. And this guy came at me very aggressively and he hit the trash can with his fist and, and he looked very aggressive and mad. And of course, I'm standing there trying to figure out what's going on next. The guy I was talking to just ran away. And this guy looks at me and he goes, Mike. And he says it like very forcefully. And he said, here in a minute, this guy in this big black car is going to come pick me up. It's going to take me to this government warehouse and they're going to take me and put me in this cage with this half man, half dog. And it's going to tear my throat out and kill me. And I'm going to have to go do it all again tomorrow. Well, at that point, I didn't have a lot of clinical training. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this and try not to be part of his delusion so I don't get attacked in the street. And and I was as I was sitting there frantically trying to figure out what to say, I saw this shift in his facial expressions. And and in his facial expressions, he usually was mean mugging. He looked mad all the time. But but in that instant, like he looked, I saw fear on his face. And then I asked him, I said, pal, I said, what you're describing sounds very frightening. It frightens me to hear it. Does it frighten you? And all of a sudden, his face softened up, his features softened up. He says, man, yeah, it scares me. And and he said a couple more sentences about the delusion. We talked about a couple other things, and he walked off. But what I didn't realize in that moment is I kept passing him in the shelter in subsequent days, and he would always wave at me, which he'd never done before. And because I had recognized his emotion and reflected it back to him, I'd become a safe person to him. And so I completely ignored the literal content of the delusion, but I focused on the emotive content and how that person was feeling about it. And you can build a connection with somebody. Now, now I don't recommend doing that if somebody's like floridly psychotic and pissed off because that could end badly. But if they're experiencing fear or sadness, if you can take that emotion and reflect it back to them, you can often build a rapport with somebody, even if they are um, expressing psychotic features. Um, be aware of the categories, again, that people would cause people to be more prone to self-harm. I think that's important. Um, be aware of previous instances of self-harm. You know, has that person tried to harm themselves previously? Because if they have uh, delusion or not, they're much more likely to engage in self-harm again. Uh, drug use, illness severity. Um, drug use is a big deal um, because for people with psychotic features, sometimes they'll self-medicate with drugs and it can just make things worse. So be aware if there's any substance use, uh, illness severity, um, and then obviously safety assessment is important. We don't want the person engaging in self-harm or harm to others. At that point, if they're, if they're looking at they're going to engage in self-harm or harm to others, we need to probably look at inpatient hospitalization. Uh, watch for patients that are actively seeking evidence to support their misguided beliefs or dangerous beliefs. Oftentimes, if I have somebody who has a psychotic disorder who's actively seeking me out or who has religious preoccupation who's actively seeking me out, a lot of times one of two things happens. Either they're trying to, uh, I guess, discredit my role and they're trying to marginalize me and my, my thoughts, or they're trying to seek me out because they think that I'm going to feed the delusional material or, or agree with them. Um, and I'm very careful in those instances when somebody starts to do that to me, I shift from religious language into clinical language to avoid doing that. And avoid responses or activities that may feed the delusion. Now, there's no actual literature out there that I'm aware of that says you can actually make a delusion worse by feeding it, um, but it's generally considered bad form. And again, listen to the emotional content of what the person says rather than the literal content. Um, Kind of align with the person. Uh, what are you? What you're sharing sounds frightening. Is it frightening to you? Focus on rapport building. Um, other ways you can do that. An example: I had a young lady I was working with. Um, I, I was supposed to have a group, and nobody showed up for the group. But she came into the room, and she said, "Mike, she said I'm being discharged tomorrow, but I'm still 
uh, having things that I'm seeing and hearing. And what was fortunate about this young lady, she had some awareness. She didn't have anosognosia. Um, unfortunately, she also had a bit of a substance abuse problem in addition to having schizoaffective disorder. And I said, well, come in, sit down, let's talk. And, and she said, Mike, she said, I'm being discharged. I'm still seeing things. I don't know what to do. And, and I said, well, I said, have you ever thought about challenging what you're seeing and hearing with somebody you trust? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, do you trust me? And she says, yeah. I said, okay, well, tell me what, what you're seeing right now. Uh, and, and I was not ready for the response. <laughs> She she looked at me. She says, "There's a demon eating your face right now." And and uh, you know, I, I was kind of taken aback by that. Like I said, I wasn't ready for that response. Um, but but I told her, I said, "Look, I said I'm not doubting your experience, but I, but I do want to tell you, I'm not having the safe experience you are. I, I want to tell you that I'm safe. Nothing is currently harming me." And I said, "What else are you seeing?" She says, "Well, I'm seeing a demon crawling out of the floor in the corner." And I said, "Again." I don't want to, to discount your experience, but I want you to know that I'm not seeing that as well. And so we did this for probably 15 minutes as an exercise, and it was kind of an emotionally tasking exercise. And so we're sitting there for a few seconds of silence, just she and I in this room, and somebody left one of the doors open and the alarm went off and I saw her eyes pop up and, and I looked at her and said, no, I hear that too. <laughs> and uh, but, but those are ways to build rapport with somebody. You're not feeding the delusion. You're, you're aligning yourself with the person and you're assisting them and trying to come up with, with positive coping strategies, in her case, to manage her delusion. Uh, but that's a rapport building is huge. Don't try to talk the person out of the delusion. Um, I, I see some of our staff try to do that. I'm like, oh, that's what medicine's for. Uh, in the 11 years I've worked here, I've never successfully talked anybody out of a delusion and I've never seen anybody talked out of a delusion. Uh, the only thing I've seen to get people out of delusion is medication. Again, validate the person's experience, but be clear of your own experience as well. Um, if you can become a safe person to the individual, and, and, and make no mistake about it, a person who's experiencing psychotic features, even if they're in that space, they're still trying to gauge whether or not the people around them are safe. I mean, that's something we do naturally as people. We're trying to keep ourselves safe, and a person with psychotic features is doing that as well. If you can be a safe person, if you can build rapport, if you can recognize that person's emotion and reflect it back to them, you, you're going to be um, in a position where you're much more likely to come alongside with that person to be able to help them and to get them to participate in therapeutic activities. Uh, a huge one, and, and man, I beat this to death in our hospital orientation with our new hires, is engaging. When you have good rapport with somebody, you can engage in, in power with activities versus power over activities. Uh, it's very tempting as a caregiver, especially when you get frustrated and you you see a person and they're not agreeing with you. You clearly see what's wrong and you can't get a, them to break through on it. It's very, very frustrating. And the temptation is to get into a power struggle. But uh, what I would suggest to you is, and I'm just going to say this out loud because how stupid it sounds. What does this say about you if you feel the need to get into a power struggle with a psychiatric patient or a person living with an SP, SPMI? Um, you know, usually this is more about us than it does about the person. So, so don't get into power struggle. Nobody wins that, and and nothing kills rapport faster than a power struggle. Um, so I can't overemphasize the the importance of rapport. So looking at all this, it's it's tempting to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, if a person's got psychotic features, if they're schizophrenic, if they have bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder, we need to avoid religious stuff. That's not true. Um, religion and spirituality are helpful for people who have delusions. Um, one study here, 115 patients who are outpatient with psychosis, 71% of them use positive coping as opposed to 14% that engage in negative coping. And so, so it can be a positive thing. Uh, in, in another study, 45% of the patients experiencing delusional content use spirituality. Um, it decreased the, the level of maladjusted behaviors that they engaged in. They had fewer hospitalizations. And again, a big one, particularly when that person has delusions that are known for being you know, more indicative of suicide and self-harm, it's a factor that protects against that. Uh, in India, one study, they looked at religious practice, practice as a predictive factor. Uh, it, it two years and found it to be um, having a, having some efficacy among Vietnam veterans. Religiosity um, had uh, you know showed decreased hospitalizations. It was a protective factor against substance abuse and a protective factor against psychiatric disorders. So that's that's a group of veterans who um, 
And so even though religion and spirituality can surface as pathological and destructive, it can also be very, very healthy in a person's life. You know, going back to the beginning of the presentation with Parkham and Lomax were saying, you know, it can give them a sense of grounding, a sense of connection, um, a sense of being able to make meaning of their world. And, and even though they're experiencing delusions, if they can use their spirituality and religion in a healthy way to make meaning or understand their illness, et cetera, it can be a very positive and beneficial thing. So a couple of pitfalls that I see for clinicians, uh, this is particularly true trying to manage religious dynamics and psychosis. Uh, like I've worked with several people that were like psychologists, that, that they themselves were spiritual or religious people. Um, one of the challenges, unless you've actually been trained to look at religious and spiritual dynamics from a clinical perspective, is falling into religious bias. So where the person may have clinical training in the field of psychology, they're coming at the religious or spiritual from their own faith perspective. And that leads to a lot of blind spots. It leads potentially to the pathologization of, of legitimate religious practices. Um, and then it can also lead to um, some conflict sometimes because you'll have people, they'll believe one thing and a patient will be presenting another and it'll, it'll create a source of conflict. And and it's a pitfall for, for clinicians trying to manage religious dynamics from their own faith perspective. Because just because you understand the behavioral sciences from a faith perspective doesn't mean that you necessarily have the acumen to deal with the spiritual or religious from a faith perspective. So, so I would caution before you get too deeply in that to, to avoid some of these pitfalls. The other thing that you get, like if you have a psychologist or a social worker that's trying to deal with religious issues, um, is the issue of perception of authority. So as a clergy person, one of the dynamics of clergy and of being an ordained clergy person is that person sees you as God's representative or whatever. That's a, that's a, there's a unique power dynamic that exists with that that doesn't exist with other disciplines. And so sometimes a patient may not see you as the authority on the matter. And, and if you push on that, that can, can cause, you know, decrease in rapport and, and um, unhealthy interactions. Uh, when is it time to elicit the help of a spiritual care professional? So uh, by spiritual care professional, I would mean somebody who uh, is a, maybe a board certified chaplain or a licensed pastoral counselor. Both groups of people have had integrative uh, training. They understand the behavioral sciences and they understand the clinical dynamics of religion and spirituality. Um, if you need any clarification regarding the patient's religious background, uh, I've often had that. Like I'll, I'll have a patient come through our um admissions process and the the qmhp will say well patient is presenting with um religious delusion well if you go back and you look at the person's faith perspective they're pentecostal and they believe in gifts of the spirit and to a person who's not aware of that and what gifts of the spirit are it does look like religious delusion and so sometimes clarification is needed um, when you're trying to figure out is this congruent with the person's stated faith perspective or not um Whenever there's a possibility of bias uh, in terms of religious practice, uh, a spiritual care professional can help. Um, when you're looking at trying to figure out if something's positive or negative from a religious coping perspective, and when you're trying to reinforce the positive coping, a spiritual professional can help with that. Um, and then, and of course, connecting or reconnecting with members of the faith community. Um, I've had instances before where I've had people that wanted to participate in the faith community, and I would try to set them up with the faith community. And then I would reach out to the leaders of that faith community, um, you know, obviously within the confines of HIPAA and privacy. Um, but, you know, I would explain symptom burdens to clergy so they understood. You know, I've done trainings for, for community clergies so they understand what SPMI looks like and, and have brief interventions of how they manage people within their congregation who may come in with SPMI. So these are all examples of when you might elicit the help of a spiritual care professional. Um, so wrap up and final thoughts about everything we've talked about. These are just, some of these are pretty obvious, y'all. Um, be sensitive to the individual you're working with. You know, recognize that no matter your perspective, that person is the expert on their own experience and what they're going through in that moment. Uh, use empathy, uh, engage with care, focus on the emotional content rather than literal content. Um, when I say listen here, I mean listen to hear rather than listen to respond. Uh, I think in our society, we're horrible about listening to respond, but we don't necessarily just listen to hear. Uh, agree when you can. You know, don't agree to something that's patently false or delusional, but you can agree when you can to try to foster that rapport. 
uh, be careful not to be condescending or adversarial. Again, avoid the power struggles. Uh, partner where you can with the individual. That's part of the rapport process. Acknowledge the individual's experience. Be clear on your own. Like the example I gave with the lady who was, was seeing the demons. You know, I acknowledge and validated her experience. But at the same time, uh, I, I want to be clear that, hey, I'm not seeing that same thing. So she can challenge her experience against, you know, my version of reality. Uh, maintain a power with versus a power over attitude and recognize that how you engage the person, you know, your approach can, can potentially change everything. So uh, I'm a little bit over on my presentation time, but we've got about 20, 21 minutes, it looks like. Um, I know that was a lot of material to throw at you in a very short period of time. What I'd like to take the next few minutes to do is to answer any questions you all may have or uh, to field any um, discussions or experiences that you've had that you may want to discuss. So I will open up our time to that. If anybody has any questions, either in the chat block or if you'd like to unmute and talk for a little bit, we can do so now. Hopefully everybody's still awake. This is the anxiety producing part of a presentation when you're looking at boxes and names and wondering if everybody's still there and has questions. <laughs> The other thing that I'll give you guys are that these are the references that I use for this presentation. Uh, I'm glad to provide you with the slideshow and the list of references if you're interested in further reading um, or if I can be a resource to you down the road, you're welcome to reach out to me. This is my, my information. Um, that's my office number. Um, that is my email address as well. So if you email me directly, um, I can send you the slides directly. I think that Joni, I'm also going to email her the slides here in a little bit. Um, and, and I've emailed them to a couple people, but, but I'll make the slides available. You can have them, um, do whatever you want to with them. And again, if I could be a resource, I'm glad to, to be however I can. your crickets. While we're waiting for those uh, questions and comments to roll in, I'm going to um, chime in with a few of our closing housekeeping items, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I'm going to copy and paste something into the chat for everybody. That will be our post-survey link, as well as a link to registration for some upcoming courses that we have. Uh, we want to thank you, Mike. I got it correct this time. Uh, for leading such a great webinar for us today. And thank you everyone for attending and spending a good chunk of your morning with us. Um, this recording will be available by the end of the month via our YouTube channel. You can just search Mental Health America of Kentucky and we aim to have everything uploaded by the end of June. Uh, the lab training is eligible for certificates of attendance. You can request one of those certificates through doing the post survey, which I have linked in the chat. You'll also receive um, that link in an email in the next few days. So if you lose it today, don't panic. And um, while I'm sending those out, I'll also attach the slide presentation. So you guys have all of that. So be looking out for that in the next couple of days. Um, I believe that's it. For any questions, please feel free to email us at mhaky at mhaky.org. Or you can reach out to me directly, j-o-n-i at mhaky.org. Um, and if you think of any other questions that you have later on for Mac, please um, send those airway and we can forward them on to him as well. Yes, thank you all again for spending your morning with me. I appreciate your time. We have not received questions, but you have gotten kudos. And thanks for being thank here. You. All right, well, that's all my contact information. If you think of questions down the road, please do reach out.